Well, thanks so much for the introduction, and thank you all for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about learning that with everyone over the next couple of days as well. Um, so yeah, as Michelle said, uh, this is me. I'm, I'm Chris Rowland. I work at uh, Soul School of Business and have been following blockchain for about a year and a half now um, in BC for about a year. Uh, I'm particularly interested, like, like Michelle said, in, in how blockchain enables new ways of organizing, new ways of creating value, and, and that's kind of what I'm going to primarily talk about today. Um, I, I teach at the Soul School of Business as well. I teach organizational behavior at the moment to undergrads, and I teach some executive education stuff at blockchain as well. Um, but yeah, just, just a precursor as well. Uh, I'm going to use a lot of slides. I'm going to try and get it through in then 50 minutes. Um, if, you, if you want to interrupt at any time, please feel free. Just ask whatever you want. Uh, you're going to get a crash course in blockchain. You're going to get a kind of non-technical kind of overview, just for the kind of just to give you context on what I want to do with it. But we can also talk more about blockchain, what it does, um, and you can kind of more. More detailed aspects about that later on if you'd like, but you can just ask Sushan, who probably knows what I do. <laughs> but yeah, so to begin with, um, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> How much did you pay for it? <laughs> 50,000. <000. laughs> yeah? Anyway, anyone want to bid higher than 50,000? One doggy time. One doggy time? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's, that's not that's more than that, uh, two cents. <laughs> sorry, sorry, so this is a crypto kitty. Worth a subject. Yeah, it's a it's a it's, it's a photo of a cat, or it's an image of a cat that you can buy and sell. Uh, and it's unique. It's, it's the only one of its kind. It's a, it's an online kind of tradable game, basically. So I'm going to be talking about the technology that enables this, this digital ownership of a thing that we just didn't have before. You couldn't have a unique um, a uh, picture of a cat before and then trade it. If you sent it to someone, there would be what we call the double spending problem, which would be you know, you'd both have the image of the cat then, and it would be really difficult to, to figure out who has the original. Okay. So how is this possible? That's what we're going to talk about today. But for context, this, this one in particular, this was found in Cat 18. Uh, that was sold in December 6th, right in the, in the middle of the, the sort of crypto hype. For 250 ether, about 250 ether, so it's about $110,000 US at the time. I don't know what it's worth now, but <laughs> this is still really an important sold. They, they average about four bucks now, so you, know, you, can, you can kind of get in the ground level here still. This is some kind of special one. Uh, but yeah, what, how are we going to get this today? So I want to talk about uh, the lot of words that I'm going to introduce you to, um, and, and I tried not to use too many jargon. Saying words, but I need a few of them. So, I'm going to be talking about going from a plutocracy to a meritocracy um, in a digital platform sense. Uh, how do we get there? And I'm going to kind of introduce platform ecosystems as the concept and then talk about them as plutocracies, what we have today. And we go from how blockchain, so this crash course in blockchain that we're talking about, how that enables what I call distributed trust. And then we're going to talk about how this kind of distributed trust models take us from blockchain to, uh, from, from a plutocracy to a meritocracy. And then, and then I kind of I try to weave in some of the things in the title. So, and then I promote ethical behavior, equitable um, distribution of value, and the empowerment of individuals. Okay. So, platforms. Platforms happened in the summer of a management um, scholar. And so, we use the organizations. Platforms are sort of any form of organizing where you use. And underline the modular core, and then facilitate interactions on top of that. So this uh, this started in in kind of manufacturing some product platforms. So you have a car, some part of that car is standardized, and you use that across multiple kind of different types of cars, and then recombine elements on top of it. Just makes it far cheaper. So it typically happened within the organization for a long time. Over time, we started having platforms that started standing outside of organizational boundaries. So you can start to to kind of outsource some of the production and innovation beyond the boundaries of your phone. So an example of this is um, this cutting edge PlayStation, which is the first one, I think. Um, but then that they expand their ecosystem to having gamers, matching gamers with people creating the games. They didn't have to create the games themselves. Uh, they, they were just kind of matching between two different markets all of a sudden. And these platform economies, when you start bringing multiple markets, you start to have something called network effects, which is if you have you know, a, a bigger user base, a bigger gamer community, it's more attractive for the other side, for, for companies to make games on your platform. Okay? So the, the idea is that you're facilitating these network effects where, in, amongst gamers as well, if there's more gamers, you might, they might attract more gamers. So you start to get these kind of economies of scale 
in, in the different markets and across these markets. So that's really what the platform business model starts trying to facilitate. Um, more recently, we've had sort of more digital platforms where users start to perform more of the work and individuals start to perform more of the work. So, for example, a really simple example here is YouTube. We have you know, people making their own videos, people consume the videos, advertisers come in there. Uh, so, essentially, it's this community where a lot of us are doing a lot of this work ourselves, so individuals, then um, other people consuming, advertisers get on board, someone's monetizing it somewhere. YouTube takes up a lot of the share of, of revenues, gives maybe some of it to, to the producers if they if, if they're really kind of influential. But uh, this is this is the kind of digital platform, sort of simplified digital platform that I'll be talking about today. So I want to keep it kind of fairly simple. I know it gets far more complex, uh, and this is what we start to get. This is the Apple kind of um, iOS ecosystem. And then you start to get lots of different actors, you know, <coughs> stringing platforms together on uh, devices. You have Manufacturers producing, then telco operators, etc. It gets kind of messy. But I want to get simple and start to you know, really focus on, on things like YouTube just to, just to kind of give, give you a sense of, of what I'm going to be searching. Um, why is this important? It's important because these business models are, are really coming into age. Like they, um, the, the, the value of data, the value of, of the, um, the user base is, is becoming incredibly large. So. This is from you know early two thousands. There's one tech company in, in the top five public trading companies by a market cap. Um, Microsoft seems to have stayed there. Then by twenty sixteen, so fifteen years later, the top five all work with some kind of uh, platform business model or multiple platform business models. So so yeah, this is becoming really really kind of uh, really influential. So this kind of talk, like I said, I really want to focus on fairly simple platform ecosystems where there's a few different sides of the market. Uh, digital platforms in which much of the work is conducted by individuals. So things like Airbnb, Uber, Upwork, Facebook, YouTube, eBay. And these, these kinds of uh, platforms that harness network effects are drawing more users, producers, and third party complements, and innovators that build apps on top of them, things like that. So the platform owner, in a sense, often collects huge amounts of data on the user base, and they often own and control that data, and that's kind of the way that they protect their user base and, and stop other platforms from, from kind of infiltrating and taking them out share. And in doing so, they generate switching costs. So switching costs would be the cost of going from one platform to another for a user. So if all my data is on Facebook, Facebook kind of owns that, I control it. It's really difficult for me to go to an alternate social media platform just because, you know, because I feel like it's, it's going to be some kind of, you know, it's fairly costly for me to take all that over. There's a lot of data they have over the years that kind of customize my experience. And there's the rest of these best, there's the network effect that keeps me on there. So it's, it's really unlikely I'm going to kind of shift uh, just because there's, there's that sort of effect when all my friends are there. Well, well, well. So, how do these proprietary platform ecosystems uh, resemble plutocracies? So, Overall, the platform itself is owned and run by a proprietary organization. So the, the ones I mentioned, eBay, YouTube, uh, Airbnb, etc. There's, there's a company in the center, and their job is to basically govern the platform as a centrally managed microeconomy. So they're trying to manage you know, pricing, uh, governance, who gets to join, what can they do with the platform, and in that way, kind of control their state, collect their data, generate their switching costs, basically. So, they basically own the personal and behavioral data of users. Uh, they render that to, to create new value. So just like I go on Amazon, they kind of know what books I want now. So it's just it's much easier for me to go on there and, and figure out what's the next thing I'm going to buy. If I go on Facebook, my, my new feeds customized for me just because of you know, my previous actions. Things like that. Google kind of knows where I've been visiting. They know what I like. Uh, the advertising revenue becomes far greater if they have that kind of data that they can aggregate. Um, then, yeah, exactly that. They monetize it. Um, they, might to, they might charge transaction fees for users to go on the platform. They might charge access to advertisers. They might charge. Uh, they might sell the data some other way. And this, like I said, helps them consolidate their position over time. So, this is what I mean by the plutocracy. It's really difficult for a challenge to come in because they're amassing a set of data that is really impenetrable. Nobody really knows how the Google algorithm works, I'm going to tell you. So, the search algorithm, for example. And because all that data is there because it can keep getting better. It's just going to be, it's, it's sort of a plutocratic arrangement where 
they, you know, the rich get richer type scenario. They control the flow of data, they control the users in, in some way. Um, the switching costs are really high. So it's, yeah, they're sort of perpetuated the position that way. And for the individual users, for us, it just means we're beholden to the decisions of the platform owner and, and their investors ultimately. Now, we'll talk about what that means in a sec. There's big risks with data privacy and security. If, if one centralized organization is holding your data, we've all, you know, we all saw what happened with Facebook this year and Cambridge Analytica. So, big problems there. Um, and like I said, there's increased switching costs over time. So, we, we sort of become increasingly beholden over time because there's a, there's a pathway where the more they have, the less we can be bothered changing, the more value we can produce naturals. So, let's take a really simple example. I made um, uh, a representation of the Uber platform in emojis. Um, so, we have a rider on the left here, a driver on the right, they want to meet up. This is a simple kind of two sided market platform. The organization in the middle has the core technology that they own, they have the interface that they own, that decides who can join, what they can do, how they find each other, what, you know, what price they pay for each. So, the company then owns the, the core of the user interface. They collect personal behavioral data to improve their service over time. No one else gets their data, so they can continue to improve it. And then they extract provisions from each interaction. But why does this mean? This is obviously suboptimal in a lot of ways. You know, we've all heard about Uber and kind of how their how their uh, employees are exploited, or employees, how their contractors are exploited. <laughs> That's what them. So this is from a, from an MIT uh, working paper that came out this year. So in the states, uh, the median profit. For drivers, about three dollars thirty-seven per hour before taxes. Seventy-four percent of the drivers earn less than the minimum wage in their state, and thirty percent were actually losing money once you take into account all their other expenses. Okay. Meanwhile, the company down here. So the company is worth about sixty-two billion. Obviously, it's private, it's difficult to tell. But last valuation around sixty-two billion. Um, reports for rampantly sexist culture. Uh, we found that out in the last couple of years, so that's how they, you know, that's how they operate internally. Um, in 2016, there were 57 million user profiles hacked, and they paid the hackers $100,000 to keep it quiet and delete their data. Maybe they did. We wouldn't know, but they told us about a year later. And the man that presided over this, he's not the CEO anymore, but he's currently <laughs> worth about $4.8 billion. So, this is what he said. So this was a, this was a conversation between then CEO uh, Travis. I can't say his last name. But just go through it. I tried to pronounce it. But Travis and the new driver having a conversation that was recorded uh, last year in February. And the new driver is kind of um, having to dig it in for saying, you know, you probably afford us to, to pay us a little bit more, you know, change your algorithm so it's a bit more favorable for the drivers. He said, well, we have to. You know, we have to keep it uh, this way. We have competitors, otherwise we go out of business. We didn't go low end because we wanted to. We went low end because we had to because we had this. Okay, fair enough. You're a, you know, you're a profit driven organization, that's how the market works. Okay. Then he sort of um, continued to challenge him, so Travis came back with this. Some people don't like to take responsibility for their own shit. They blame everyone in their life, everything in their life on someone else. Good luck. Okay. So that's. Uh, so if there's a theme to my talk today, it's about people taking responsibility for their own shit. And we're going to see how we can do that. <laughs> With distributed trust technologies. So that brings me to the next part. Blockchain and distributed trust. And I want to preface this by saying I'm going to talk about blockchain, I'm going to talk about distributed trust, obviously. Blockchain is not the only distributed trust technology. So if something then you know, overtakes blockchain in the future, there's, there's some things in the works, obviously nothing kind of really working at the moment, but the principles that I talk about will still hold for those technologies. Well, yeah, let's talk about blockchain quickly and how that works, little crash course, uh, and then how that enables distributed trust, and then we'll talk about what that means. Okay. So blockchain, does it, who here has a, has a good understanding of blockchain? I saw some of the theory and shit before, so I think some of us are probably far more advanced than me. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to throw a few words at you and then, and then we'll see uh, if we can get there and if I can explain blockchain to the, to the point that it, it serves the purpose. So it's a distributed ledger that records something of value, it's distributed, okay? Again. It's immutable and it's cryptographically secure. So that's the fun, fundamental of what blockchain is, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then some blockchains have digital tokens that represent assets, uh, different degrees of permission and transparency, and smart contracts. So these are the kind of really fundamental things we need to grasp before we can understand how, how we organize them. 
Okay, so a distributed network. This is something we always see when people present blockchain. Um, so on the, on the left here, we have a centralized network, you know, single point of failure. Starts to become more decentralized, so multiple points of failure in the middle there, and then a distributed network, no single point of failure. There's, uh, it's just a network, you know, anyone can kind of participate basically in, in, in this sense. Um, does anyone know where this image comes from? Because this is always brought up when we, yeah, the, uh, the RAND Institute, Paul Baran. Yes, Paul Baran, RAND Institute, 1964. So do you, do you, do you know why? Well, I know that I know it because it's in my presentation tomorrow. It is? <laughs> networks in, in, in that the risk of communicating, the robustness of communication networks exposed to the risk of nuclear attack. Bang on. Yeah. Well done. So this is, um, <laughs> yeah, so the transatlantic communications network that would stand a nuclear attack in the 60s, basically. And that became the early world for the internet. So you can see uh, if you're you know, trying to shoot yourself from nuclear attack, what the, what the problems would be if you had a centralized or even a decentralized network. Okay. All of the nodes in this network, in a blockchain network, have a copy of the same ledger. So the same copy of, of some kind of ledger that just says who holds what. Uh, if someone comes in and tries to change then, you know, a, a version of the ledger, the rest of the network is going to say, no, it's inaccurate. Um, we know that's inaccurate. Unless they hack half of the computers in the network, which is extremely difficult to do. Uh, it gets changed back, the ledger gets restored to, to normal. Okay. And then the other part of this is that value can be really efficiently exchanged on the network. So the ledger has a record of who holds what, whatever that is. The first uh, blockchain is Bitcoin, so who holds what Bitcoin. Could we could represent whatever you want. Um, but the, the point is that we can, we can efficiently exchange the value in the network uh, you know, to someone else. And that transaction is, is authenticated by the network itself, by a distributed bunch of computers, rather than a single a trusted third party. So all of a sudden we can have, we're, we're able to exchange value without any single actor really being kind of having, having uh, control of the transaction. There are customizable features. So, like I said, Bitcoin was the first blockchain, or it does record how many Bitcoin uh, people have, and uh, we can exchange that efficiently and use this currency. Other blockchains came through and they started to, to do different things. So we can start to, to build on, on top of that. Um, now we have, I mean, well, blockchains in general are digital tokens. So tokens are something that can just represent anything you want, essentially. Represent property, represent commodities. Uh, currencies like Bitcoin, or you can represent fiat currencies like Canadian dollars on a blockchain. Uh, loyalty points, for example, airline points, for example. Um, utility tokens, we call utility tokens on a platform. So um, that's typically, so if I put Uber on a blockchain, then I could have Uber coin. Uh, or shares in a company, for example, other kind of tradable assets, pictures of cats. Um, <laughs> incidentally, not the pictures of the cats, but their underlying DNA would be the, would be the, thing, the thing that happened on the blockchain. Uh, but yeah, the, these are tokens, that's what we call tokens. They may be invisible, they might be non fungible, so they might be really unique. Um, typically, the, the things that we're talking about will be, will be fungible tokens, so they're invisible and, and interchangeable. Um, the other thing I want to just clarify up front as well is that I'm talking here about public blockchain networks, not permissioned blockchain networks. So it is possible to restrict access to people. I'm talking about uh, open public blockchain networks where anyone can join and then we can see the history of the ledger. So things like Bitcoin, Ethereum are these, are these examples. Uh, permission blockchain networks, you would have them if it's, it's a more kind of industry based solution. So you would have, if you want to put your supply chain on a blockchain, something like that, then it's more likely you're not going to want everyone in the world to see that. So you would have permission access to your supply, to the, to the kind of organizations in your supply chain. And smart contracts. So smart contracts are the thing that allow us to do things kind of efficiently and then the things that automate transactions by kind of bridging the, uh, the blockchain with the, with the real world. So smart contracts get execute, they're just strings of code that execute if-then statements. So um, a real world analogy for this, and you hear this pretty commonly if you, if you see a blockchain talk, is, uh, is a vending machine. So a vending machine works on a couple of if-then statements. So if I put in the money, then it will allow me to enter a code. If I enter a code you know, that corresponds to something, 
and, and money thread, then my drink will come out or whatever I'm buying. Okay? So it's just a couple of simple if then statements that allow me to do, you know, perform a transaction without any sort of third party intermediary deciding something or you know doing anything basically. Uh, if we link a blockchain to a real world kind of um, practice like email, so we can have uh, an if then statement that says if I send Rochelle an email and she opens it, then I pay her. Maybe I pay her at like fractions of a cent. Okay, so it doesn't really matter to me uh, if I send 20 emails a day, right? So I'm um, you know these tiny fractions of value being shipped around. But why would we do this? Because if I send 10,000 emails a day, then I start to notice, right? I start to get like, a pretty heavy bill. So this kind of simple if that statement, the simple smart contract link to something like email, it's pure spam. Uh, a third type of smart contract, so there's something interacting between the ledger and the real world, would be, it's, this has been proposed, I'm sure it's going to happen at some point, uh, if your car, you buy a car, and your car is on the internet of things, and you have a contract with the, the company, you know, with the, um, with the automaker that says, you're still paying it off, so you're paying off your loan, if you miss three months in a row of that loan, then your car stops working. And then once you make a payment again, once you resume paying, your car opens up. Okay. So a couple of these smart contracts, but then now, you, now the uh, automaker has control of the asset you know, after the sale, and uh, no one really has to make that decision. There's still, there's still just no third party doing anything. So this is how we can kind of um, self-organize things, how we can, how we can uh, enforce yeah, agreements, basically, with that, that sort of a third party. Okay, how do we link this to trust? So we talk about trust often when we talk about blockchain and just to clarify what I mean by trust, this is what we often think about when we, when we uh, talk about trust, right? We, we think about trust in other people. And people always talk about, um, you know, Bitcoin is a trustless network because you don't need to trust people, which is fine. You're absolutely right. Um, I think of trust as a process. So you can put trust in individuals and organizations you know, some other entity, or you can put trust in a process. So if you think about trust as a process, it's just the belief that something will happen. It's kind of what Rachel Botsman calls a confident relationship to the unknown. So you're trusting that something will happen, basically. So there is trust. It's just not trust in, in kind of an individual at the other end of the transaction, or it's not trust in someone like, you know, an engineer like Airbnb that they're going to sort you out if someone builds your house down. So distributed trust, in a sense, is the belief that something will happen in a distributed network, and so you basically, you're essentially putting your trust into a technology, into the, into the kind of coded processes in the technology, rather than any intermediary and rather than a person at the other end of the transaction. So let's, uh, yeah. How, how blockchain enables this? Well, like I said, the consensus is distributed, so we, we can authenticate transactions in a distributed network, so it limits the scope of cheating. Uh, it increases transparency across the network. We have digital tokens that verify ownership, so we know who holds that token, what that represents. And we can align incentives, because we might be able to be kind of incentivized to promote the value of the token. So if we attack the Bitcoin networks, uh, you know, if, if I go and attack Bitcoin, I can't do it, but this is a hypothetical, and I steal, you know, 80% of Bitcoin, like, good for me, <laughs> what's going to happen to the value of Bitcoin? It's going to go to zero, we're going to stop using it. So there's an incentive for me not to do that, right? Because what's the point? Uh, then we have smart contracts that automate transactions, reduce those transaction costs, uh, get rid of human error, and, and eliminate fraud in many cases. So for the first time, we have digital platforms in which actors can behave in a fully self-interested manner that can function without the oversight of any trusted intermediary. Okay? And I think this is uh, what's really important here. This is what's really important about distributed trust here. We have platforms already that are community-based. They don't have to be owned by, by a company. We have Wikipedia, we have Linux. But those kinds of platforms still rely on people at the center. They still rely on trusted people at the center doing things. And people giving up their time, people have to believe in something, right? They have to believe that you know, this is worthwhile. Um, they have to donate, they have to volunteer their time. Now, we can have a bunch of assholes 
that are fully self-interested <laughs> and the network will still work. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, so this is, uh, <laughs> this is actually, yeah, yeah, so this, so this is incredible. There's just ethics that's come into this and, and it's not fully like that, but this is kind of simplified version. The, a network will run if we behave in a self-interested way, which we can do before. So what? So what's happened? I mean, we know we know what's happened in the blockchain space so far. We know what's happened in the ICO space. Um, a lot of the times, you know, with early technologies, we're building something that aren't necessarily particularly useful. Uh, I'll give you some examples of that. So, <laughs> hot coins. This is, this is some some of the things that have come up in the last year. This is just to give you a taste of, of early innovation. But the coin was a was a cryptocurrency that was invented to be the currency of medicinal marijuana. Um, I don't know why we need a, a particular currency just to buy and sell with this one on it, but they've done it right. There's, I, I think the market cap is around 30 million um, I checked recently. So that's okay. I, I'm still, it hasn't been built, it's just a way of raising money to, to build a platform where you uh, buy and sell weed through this particular coin. Now, another one which was already mentioned was Dogecoin. Yes. And I'm not saying this is totally useless, I think this is great. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so this actually started as a joke. Uh, it was caught from the Bitcoin network. Correct me if I'm wrong. And, and it was, uh, yeah, so it started, you know, you can actually copy these networks in their entirety because the code's public and then kind of create your own thing with the same history but a different future, change a couple of rules. And that's what happened with Dogecoin. So they said, yeah, we can create Dogecoin. It was a big joke when it started, it's actually being used. Market caps quite a lot, something like 700 million? I don't know. It's it hit 2 billion. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, so that's, that's that's cool. Cool. Yeah. Just, just the point being that it's, yeah, we can do this. Like, it's possible to create these things, but it's fairly easy to create these things as well. Um, you can just be in networks. There's a Putin coin. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't think he did it. I don't think he did it. But anyways, um, there's a Putin coin. Someone made a Putin coin. And of course, because the Putin coin, <laughs> it's a strong coin. I checked uh, earlier this week, it's not worth as much as the food coin. <laughs> um, and I don't think that one's decentralized. I think actually Trump owns all the uh, Putin owns all the Trump coins. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, you can, you can make them. It's, it's, <laughs> we can probably make one today. I don't know if you can, we're not going to have time, but um, it's, it's possible <laughs> to create these networks with, with you know, not a huge cost. Um, this, this is my favorite, actually. This is my favorite. Uh, use this in the room token. So, so this is kind of the peak hype last year. Someone said, a lot of these are useless, right? A lot of these tokens are bullshit. So I'm going to make one that's explicitly bullshit and see what happens. This is what they put on the website. The world's most <laughs> first, and was first, 100% honest theory of ICO. You're going to give some random person the internet money, and they're going to go take it and go buy stuff with it. Probably electronics, to be honest. Maybe even a big screen television. Seriously, don't buy these tokens. What do you think happened? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah, so, so far, I'm just going to work so I don't know how often they update this. <laughs> uh, 310 either so far, about 250,000 US. Good for them. <laughs> <laughs> So what does this mean? And, and here I'm going to talk about more kind of um, long-term things. And I know there's all sorts of problems with this, there's all sorts of challenges to get there, the technology's not scalable, uh, there's lots of organizational challenges you know, that on the way. But what I want to do is take a, a long-term perspective and come back and we can talk about all those challenges later on. But this is this is a this is a utopia we're going to talk about. Okay? And this is what I think we should we should aim for at least. So the rise of platform meritocracy, what does this mean? Uh, we're talking about distributed organization, organization governance, individual ownership of data, and like I said, this ethics, uh, equity and empowerment for individuals. Okay, start with an example. So this is how music streaming looks today. Now who has Spotify or Apple Music or something like that? Yeah, so this is kind of exactly how it works. You have listeners on the top here, streaming platform, Spotify, whoever. A bunch of intermediaries, so record labels, uh, publishers, rights organizations, things like that. And down on the bottom, we have musicians, so they might get something. They get a little bit when we, when we listen to music, not very much. We have a distributed um, alternative to this. This is a fairly centralized platform, kind of proprietary platform, uh, photography, like I was talking about. 
We did. We used to have a really good uh, distributed solution for this. Do you, do you remember what it was? Yes. Yes. Yeah, piracy. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so this one you have customers on the side here, and the musicians over here just you know, completely not involved at all. <laughs> they suboptimal if you're a musician. You know, you know, you're not getting anything to your work, but listeners have a great time. Um, a, a different alternative. <laughs> using blockchain technology, using distributed network. We put the music on a blockchain. And like I said, there's, there's all sorts of challenges to that, you know, scalability and things like that. But suppose we put <coughs> music on a blockchain. Um, this is a, a you know a thing that I stole from MusicCoin, so um, to credit that because they're right in the middle. But uh, the diagram works. So we have listeners around the top here listening to music on blockchain. But when you listen to a song, the smart contract says, okay, if you listen to this song, then money goes from your account, whatever it is, if it's MusicCoin, if it's something else, uh, then gets distributed along sort of how they wanted to distribute it, how it was programmed, to the artists. So the artists at the bottom get that directly. There's no intermediary here. There's no one that you know, authorizes this. There's nothing that really happens. You know, it's just fully coded, fully distributed. The artists should basically get 100% you know, of, of what they've uh, put up there. Yeah, do you have a question? Well, I'm just curious when you say there's no intermediary, like, who, who decides the rules? And who Great question. So, when I talk about no intermediary, I mean no intermediary to run these networks, but yeah, someone has to create them. <laughs> and we'll talk about, I'll, I'll go back into, like, someone has to build this, right? And they're probably going to build it for a profit to begin with, but I'll, I'll come back to this later. But I think as a trajectory over time, because this model is really transparent, if it's on a positive blockchain, we can see how it works. If someone builds this and they start saying, okay, yeah, you can. You know, I'm just going to take like 10% of every transaction that happens because I built a network, right? I, I can decide the rules. It's pretty easy for me to then say, okay, cool, I can see how that works. I'm just going to make another one you know, next to yours on the same blockchain, but I'm going to make it free. So I think as a trajectory, we could have, um, yeah, this, it, it might start as profit oriented uh, kind of creation of these things, and then it might head towards later on this sort of um, um, narrowing down of margins and, and finding out. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are private companies, are No, no. No, Bitcoin and Ethereum are just distributed networks. There's no... So there's nobody actually No one runs it. No. No, no. It's, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a distributed network of, of people running the software. Um, yeah, so someone decides the rules to clear the start. They can change if you can convince enough people in the network to change the rules. Or you can, like I said, copy the network in its entirety and start a different one with different rules. And it just depends on whether everybody supports it, essentially. Yeah. Is there anything like this in sort of the film model or in terms of uh, you know, aiming type of production? Or... Yeah, the film model. Um, not that I know of yet. It's, and probably for the reason that it's, a film is like a huge. <laughs> it's a massive part, so um, it's going to take a while. I think this is going to take a while as well. I, I'm not. A, I'm, I'm a sociologist. So I'm not. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to like. I don't know all the technical problems. But yeah. I just met a local guy at the Yale because um, they're working on something called Bitflix. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like blockchain, Netflix, cool. centralized. Yeah. So Bitflix, and then there might be some kind of. If they're doing it soon, there might be some sort of arrangement where they store that data centrally and then provide access to it. Well, yeah, I don't know. It's specifics, but... Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, some other examples. So distributed energy networks. So if we take spin into the real world now, currently we get energy from utilities, um, centralized production, down the bottom here. Uh, suppose we all put, this is happening as well, it's happening in a lot of places, but we put solar panels on our roofs. And then the excess electricity that we generate, we can decide whether we want to sell that to our neighbors. If the neighbor wants to buy it um, from us rather than from the grid, then a smart contract executes and they pay us you know, whatever. So a distributed kind of localized energy energy grid that runs itself essentially. Um, this is not a fully, I mean, you still need an intermediary here, obviously the utilities will need to maintain the, the power and things like that. But uh, yeah, this is towards an example of how we can have a distributed solution for something we currently centralize. Centralized versus distributed cloud storage. So currently in cloud storage, we, we store things, you know, if you store a Dropbox or on web services, it's stored in their facilities. It's stored somewhere centrally. In uh, something looks like that, it's not very clear, but um, a big funnel of service. 
and all the money that you pay goes to the company to store that data. There's a bunch of uh, distributed solutions coming up, so these are some examples, where you can rent out, as an individual, you can rent out your hard drive space, and you can say, okay, yeah, I've got like two gig spare, so I'll rent that out to the network. If it gets used, so we'll put the data in a file, it gets broken up, encrypted, sent to um, this distributed network of computers around the world. If your space is used by the, by the, um, by the application, then they'll pay you automatically in cryptocurrency. So this is kind of automated, automated payment there. Centralized versus distributed online marketplaces. So I've got Amazon here, I know it's not fully having part of some online marketplace, it does a lot of other things, it does distribution, you can't just replicate. But let's take eBay for example. So it's an online platform, charges 5 to 10 percent of each transaction, and the company tracks and stores your behavioral data. Same, similar type of plutocracy uh, I've been talking about. An alternative to this is OpenBazaar. There's, there's a few, but OpenBazaar is one. Uh, one. One kind of, um, one of the main ones. So it's open source software that you download, kind of like the torrent uh, sharing software that we talked about before. There's no transaction fees. There's no intermediary, not OpenBazaar, not anyone, that can view or store your data. They can't see what you're doing. Uh, and you can pay in cryptocurrency. So it's basically just, they've, they've set a foundation where they just create a network that, that links people and doesn't charge transaction fees for that. Okay. So these distributed platforms that we're talking about, to me these present more meritocracies rather than plutocracies. And why? So overall, they're owned and run by a distributed community. They might be set up by, by a particular organization, but they can't, they don't own the underlying infrastructure as, as they would in a, in a plutocracy. Uh, the, mission, the participation and innovation on some of these networks is permissionless. So anyone can join, anyone can kind of innovate, you can build whatever you want to these things. And the rules are transparent, you can see exactly how the transactions are being conducted, what the rules of the transactions are, because they're on a public blockchain. So I'm, again, I'm only talking about these public networks that we can see. And no single actor here is essential. So no single actor has you know, direct control of things. So even if MusicCoin set up the, sets up the, the, um, the distributed uh, music sharing platform, then it's still not essential there. We can still, they can still run it on a, on a public ledger without doing that. So what does this mean for firms? They can't set formal rules, or they can't coerce anyone. They can't withhold resources. They can't stop people from joining. They can't stop people from you know, different types of participation. They can on their interface, but their interface isn't the only thing. It's, it's on an underlying ledger that this happens, and someone can build an alternate interface with their own rules. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so firms exist in a meritocracy only if they actually provide value to each transaction. I'll show you what this means in, in, in the next slide. They have to actually contribute value rather than just enforce, you know, sort of, um, enforce the rules and uh, enforce governments. And for individual users, that means we have the opportunity in these kinds of networks to own and control our personal data. Uh, we have an ability to decide what happens with that data, an example in a minute. And there's limited switching costs across platforms. I'll talk about this in a minute as well, because all of a sudden we can take the, if the underlying data is on a public blockchain and it's ours, then it's much less costly, it's much easier for us to shift between different interfaces and the interface will be just optional. There'll just be ways for us to access that. So yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, so what firms, can you give an example of firms that exist that do not provide value in each transaction? What, what is that? Yeah, um, I would say things like, so every firm provides value in a sense and it depends on the user what that value is. So I'm talking about um, this is kind of individualized all of a sudden, so users themselves can decide which which platform we're going for that now because it provides value to them. Um, I honestly think companies like uh, Airbnb they provide value, but if you could have an alternative that you know where Airbnb didn't you know wasn't there in the middle uh, on a distributed network, and you work out those kind of organizational challenges, maybe you need to pay a third party for insurance, but not for you know, not for the transaction itself. Firms that only provide a conduit for interactions, perhaps eBay is the, the biggest one. They're just a conduit, right? Like the you know you can transact and pay for the platform. I don't think there's a huge you know value component there that they're really giving to the, to the transaction. If we can do that outside of them, um, that that would be the closest example. 
when you start to get more complex um, sort of platforms where the data, you know, if the data is aggregated and it's changed and you know they can enhance your experience by by kind of using your data, um, things like Amazon, Google, Facebook, then the value starts to come in, I think. So they might survive in a, in a sort of more merit meritocratic environment. You might be willing to let them have that data just for that experience. But uh, yeah, really simple transactions I think um, are the ones that struggle. Yeah. Um, so I'll give an example, well, fundamentally, in each transaction, we'll talk about this in a minute, but the individual will have the ability, and, and this is a, a prototypical platform meritocracy, so this is the, this is the utopia, the ability to select the fairest, most, most ethical option, or what they think the fairest, most, most ethical, most valuable option for them is. Okay. So let's take the ride-sharing example that we talked about before. Remember before there was, uh, there was Uber or whoever left over in the middle here, uh, and we had the rider and the driver. Now we have the rider, we have um, some kind of public open source blockchain solution where we can transact value between riders and drivers. And then for this, not all of us, myself included, definitely not me, are going to be able to interact directly with, with the blockchain, right? It's, I don't know who can. Um, but there's going to be some rules that you know, set out when the value shifts and we need something to, to kick off those rules. So we have some interfaces here that might be Uber, it might be Lyft, it might be something else that we create uh, that can kind of perform this function and, and we can use this sort of the, uh, this mobile application or whatever it is to link to the drivers but the transaction, the underlying transaction and the data from the transaction happens in the blockchain, happens in the top of the blockchain, okay? So the point is that these, op these uh, interfaces are optional. You can have a lot of, like there's, there's no single kind of uh, organization up here that can control that data and that can stop anyone else from seeing it. So if someone comes in and says, yeah, I'm gonna write an interface for this and I'm gonna take 30% out of every transaction, good for them, that's fine. But what if someone comes in and says, let me take 20? And then someone says, yeah, I'll take five. Um, my feeling is if we have you know, interfaces that are available and the underlying data can't be controlled by the proprietary organization, then those margins will just be stripped away. And someone will end up just building one interface that strings them all together and just picks the best option for you. This is distant future again. And maybe it was not a good example for this either because the car we drive itself, maybe these people would be. That was the cars. But anyways. To bring it back, so the, the individual, they can decide what they do with the data. They have the opportunity to, to um, own the data from the transactions, to own the data from what they do. So what do they do? They might want to sell it to advertisers, maybe. They could sell it themselves, rather than the, the organization, by them and selling to advertisers. They could give it back to one of the, uh, one of the interfaces and say, okay, I'll give you my data so that you can improve the experience for me the next time. Maybe that's, uh, that's something, it's kind of what we do now, but not voluntarily. Um, yeah. So I'm a little confused because the, the blockchain is public, mm -hmm. so how is the data not then publicly accessible? Yeah, so this is... Else. Yeah, you're right. So I'm um, giving a pretty simple bad example. There's there are different ways, there can be different ways of withholding you know, what you can see on a, on a blockchain. Maybe you don't want to put your whole identity there as well because of you know, regulation, talked about the GDPR before. Um, but yeah, you're right, you're absolutely right. There might be, if it's just transactional data, you know, who's uh, transacting what, then that might be fully public. So then you might have well, you know, different firms competing for that data and they don't have to pay the individual, they're just competing to, to kind of... They don't have to pay anybody because it's all... Exactly, it's yeah, exactly. Free for the taking. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so some data, yeah, so some data... Fall apart? Sorry? Doesn't this whole thing fall apart? Um, no, because you have, you'll have both. So you'll have individuals that can control some of the data, okay. I'll give it a, it's, it's hard because we don't have these things yet, but uh, say, for example, the, um, uh, the, the online marketplace, okay? You know what we sold, you know what we bought and sold, and your account might have data on what we bought and sold, but the blockchain will only see you know, your wallet that's on the blockchain, which is string code, and then a transaction happening with someone else's wallet. So depending on who you want to give, you will have all the data of like, how you've been shopping, um, and then the public data might be something else. Often it would just be transactional, you know, between two wallets. They might be anonymized, they might not be, so the data might be kind of more valuable, you know, publicly. Uh, but it, it really depends on the, on the type of network. Um, so you end up with a, uh, you end up with anonymized data, and you end up with a, the, well, the, 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 the
the possibility of the anonymizing that data. I mean, it's not like that isn't solvable, but yeah. it's, it's definitely part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, like I said, I'm talking like long term. It's going to be different types of organization configuration. It's going to be different ways. You know, different data that's available uh, in different aspects. So I don't know all the answers for that. But this is a this is a hypothetical. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so the smart contracts are they defined and rigid, or is there any diversity or um, flexibility to change the contract? Maybe some driver wants to charge differently than others. Like, how is that? Different? Yeah, they'll just join a different. Uh, They'll just join a different platform, basically. So each network has its rules set, and then if you want, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Change, you have to create. Something. You can just you can just shift to a different one, yeah. But for the driver, if you, um, I mean, you can build an interface that would just interact with different contracts, essentially. So it just figures out what the driver wants, and then yeah, interact that way. Um, yeah, in Modern, like there's lots of different combinations. You know, this relationship between the kind of underlying core that facilitates those transactions. And the interfaces that do that, I think that that's what has been broken at the moment. So uh, previously that was all within one company, so just a side help us to things interact. Yeah. Um, so but yeah, with our own data, suppose we have our own data, and, and maybe we have a better example of something where it's important to hold your own data if no one else can have it. And this is not maybe a strict uh, kind of digital platform example, but if we take healthcare, currently our health data is siloed to all the health professionals that we go see. So you go see a doctor and they have data on you, and you go see a physio and they have data on you. Okay. It's really difficult to get from one to another. It's really difficult to kind of, even though we're supposed to, supposedly supposed to own our health data in, in Canada, it's really difficult to, to actually get that from uh, these different providers. So suppose we had one single account or one single wallet that every time you went to see a medical professional, they would put that data into your wallet and then you would provide access to others. You know where you wanted to see it. So you would turn up to, to somewhere and say, um, "Here's you know this part of my health history." Um, but you can carry that around with you now. So that's that's kind of what I'm talking about here. And that's that's perhaps when you would start to get these options. You can kind of monetize that by selling it. You can provide it to uh, to whoever to create new value. You can give it to research, donate it. You can do something else. I'm not sure. But there might be new things that we can do once we have this possibility to control parts of that data. Um, yeah. Again, I'm going back to this combination of <laughs> the underlying transaction data that just open on the blockchain and the individual data that, that only you have. Yeah, it's really difficult to think about like, other you know, examples, but we're going to see multiple combinations there, I think. So let's bring it back to crypto keys. Um, <laughs> I think this is a platform meritocracy. It's not, a, it's not a perfect platform meritocracy, but this is the kind of closest example of what we have locally and what we have in Vancouver and what we have actually working and making money. So CryptoKitties, again, you've got cats that you sell. Uh, like I said, they're a digital token, so each cat is just a string of code on the blockchain. It's a unique, non-fungible token. And you can, uh, it's, it's, this token is just bought and sold, traded on Ethereum, essentially. You can breed them with other tokens, <coughs> with other cats, and create new tokens. Um, but it's only the CryptoKitties interface that will, the only the CryptoKitties website that will render this into the image of the cat. So the Kubernetes organizations, Axiom Zen in Vancouver, they provide an optional interface that could be used by the community. And this is still, it's not a traditional, it's not a democracy anymore because, like I said, the tokens are traded on the Ethereum blockchain, so it's public, it's open source core. <coughs> and it's possible to trade your tokens, it's possible to interact directly with the blockchain without paying the organization. We haven't had that before, it wouldn't be any fun, um, you wouldn't know what your cat looked like unless you went to their website, but it is possible. So what I'm saying is they, they still provide an optional interface, and someone else could just have their own website that, that kind of renders those tokens into different types of images. Or they could copy the whole network and say, it's possible for us to see exactly how this works. We know exactly what smart contracts they use. We know exactly how much they transacted. We know exactly how much the organization is making from this. It's fully transparent because these transactions are publicly available. Uh, so what would happen if we copied it and then you know, copied the entire network and just made different images? It's happened. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Before, before I get there, um, there's, there's applications on top of this. So when I talk about permissionless innovation, anyone can build something on top of CryptoKitties because they can't stop you, because the, the token is public and open source. So one example is uh, this, this new website they started called Kitty Hats. And so you've got, this is, this is my cat here, and you can put hats on it. 
<laughs> so <laughs> this is something you could buy. And the, the cool thing about this is, I don't own this hat, the cat owns the hat. <laughs> so, so the cat, if I sell this hat, if I sell the cat, sorry, it will take the hat with it. So now we have cascading ownership, we have digital ownership, and that thing can own stuff. So we didn't have this before. Um, here's some other examples of belly slippers on the cat, uh, a mask, and, um, you can make it into a bell hop. This one's just got a dead bird. Um, but the point is that we can just, you know, this, this, uh, again, it's a meritocracy because we decide that we need this, and you know, it's, it's not um, essential to kind of transact these interfaces, it's just something that we kind of add on if we feel like it. So these, these organizations exist without permission, it's not essential. Um, like I said, what would happen if we took this whole network and took the underlying code, it's public, it's on GitHub, and just started something new, and we said, okay, I'm not going to use the, the key images, I'm going to use something else. And that's happened. So we have crypto puppies, this is an example of crypto puppies, uses exactly the same code, but they've just, got, they've just made different images. Um, there's crypto zombies, yeah. which looks fun, I don't know. Um, there's crypto tulips, which I think is a bit of a nod to the uh, to the tulip uh, <laughs> prices. In, uh, so, so these are all on the same blockchain or a copy network? Yeah, these are, these are all on the Ethereum network. They're just a copy of the of the code from CryptoKeys. But do they copy the chain or do they use the same chain? So the underlying chain, the Ethereum blockchain, is the same. Okay. Yeah. But the application is, yeah, you can just, because uh, anyone can create tokens on Ethereum, you know, customized tokens. Um, yeah, good question. So basically, like I said before, I want to think of this as not just, you know, this, I'm talking about utopia, I'm talking about there's all sorts of problems and challenges before we get there. And there's all sorts of possible combinations of things once we do get there. But if we think about it as a trajectory towards platform meritocracy, so if we're going to go back in time, we have these traditional organizational models, and I'll use the example of, let's take Uber because we can go over that one. Um, we used to own the cars, you know, those taxi companies. But then actually, like, so Uber came and just put a platform model on this. So we don't have to own the cars anymore, we can just, you know, get them, but we can own cars and that's just a more efficient way of organizing. Um, but the thing was that we always think of, you know, that's super disruptive, right? Brilliant from them. Cabs are already using apps, they were already using uh, GPS, they were already using things to, to kind of, um, a, a lot of the things that Uber was doing, they were already doing. It's just a different way of organizing that's all of a sudden better and cheaper and more efficient. Okay. Then we had, yeah, so now we have this kind of age of proprietary platforms, and I showed that, that um, figure at the start that said you know, most of the world's biggest companies on market cap are using these business models. I think what will happen next, as I mentioned this before, is that these organizations will start to replicate these models on blockchain just because it's cheaper. Just because it's, it's cheap, like it's much more efficient to use smart contracts and uh, and sort of value on blockchain to shift around because the transaction costs go really, really low when we do that. So there might be incentive for property organizations to create these things on public blockchain or on their own blockchain or whatever. But what they're doing, what they're doing by doing this is basically copying what we have now. When I talked to the people from Open Bazaar, I'm sure they won't mind me saying this, but they were, I, I said like, you guys are just a, you know, they're, they're, they're just creating a distributed network that can buy and sell stuff online. I said, how do you design your interface? Because you have to, you know, you'll have to put a lot into design, um, figuring out, you know, what should go where. So we'll just look at eBay because we know that they're putting millions of dollars into figuring out how everything should look. So just going to come to that. Um, same thing with Uber and Airbnb. They've changed legislation, they've changed regulation in cities all around the world so that we can uh, have these models where people look at self self-employed or contracting to, to an organization like that. But they've outsourced a lot of that accountability onto the users. So they're actually taking themselves out of the equation a lot. They've culturally they've got, you've got us used to staying in these places that got us used to getting into a car with a stranger, which we wouldn't have done before. So a lot of the things they're actually paving the way for a more distributed solution. They're actually kind of taking themselves out and putting the responsibility, taking that accountability and putting it onto the user. Just by things like any ratings, any user ratings they have to behave well. So then we might have these, these property organizations put their thing in the blockchain. But again, like I said, they're just showing us how to do it. They're just showing the next wave. And I think in a lot of places, we won't fully get there, but some places, some really simple solutions where, where kind of, um, a set of smart contracts can perform that efficiently enough, we might get to this meritocratic utopia where those profits basically go to zero. You can't 
I don't think you should be making money just from being a country anymore because we can have a public blockchain that does that. Maybe if you, you can add value, but that's what I mean by meritocracy. So that we can choose whether we want to use them in that transaction. Just a little caveat before I finish. So merit obviously means something different depending on the context. So this is just some examples. Uh, in Christianity, merit is good work that seems to have a claim to a future reward from a graceful God. In Buddhism, merit accumulates the result of good deeds, acts, or thoughts, and in Islam, merit is a reward that accrues from the forms of good deeds and piety. Okay? So just to be clear, like merit is contextual. Um, what is considered good, pious, you know, whatever else depends on the context. So to, just, to, just to sum up, uh, technologies like blockchain or distributed trust technologies, they can enable a meritocratic society, a meritocratic way of organizing, like I said, but that really depends, it really is up to us what merit means in that context. So if we want those things that I talked about at the start, if we want greater equity, uh, equality, individual autonomy, if we want data ownership, and um, these kinds of things, then we need to instill these culturally, it's valuable. So it's not just going to happen. Um, we need to, yeah, we need to go off to the ship with this. Uh, I just had a question. Is there a place for unions in this world? <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah, I mean, so a union where you would you would unionize so that you have bargaining power against something? Sure. Uh, like, well, like, I mean, trying to think exactly you can do transactions to transaction. Mm -hmm. You're removing middlemen, and the union is a middleman. Yeah. In the same way the university is a middleman. Yeah. I mean, you can do student to teacher without the university. Like, in all these scenarios, but the union's what, I mean, there's always somebody who will do it cheaper, so without the union in a lot of these scenarios, you have people working for a non-livable wage. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, so non-livable wages is, is one assumption there. Um, the, the models that I've proposed are still what I think better than the alternative for what we have today, because there's going to be no one taking that out, and you can decide for yourself what you want to, you know, how much you want to charge for that work. Uh, whether there's a benefit in collectively organizing through a union or something like that, so you have more bargaining power, I don't know, I really think it would depend on the context. But again, like the the point is that no one will necessarily control how the how the integration takes place, there'll just be options and the way the union in a way was the first response to this problem. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, I mean does that mean it's replaced now or what is the Maybe in, uh, for, I mean, do we unionize the Uber or Airbnb? Like, I think, it, it, I'm only really talking about one specific way of organizing. I think if you're, yeah, um, different types of organizations might, yeah, might still have less for unions. Um, there might be less for union here if they can show that it has value, they can show that it has, yeah. But, uh, yeah, good question. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't thought about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, should we? Yes, yeah, so I think it's sort of interesting. <clears throat> There's a kind of a fundamental underlying ethical regime here, which is that this is a fundamentally individualistic, engaging, mm -hmm. contractual relations um, regime. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, a, a lot of what makes living worthwhile is the, are the inefficiencies and social solidarities whereby we say we smooth out the individual differences between us because we value each other's humanness even if one of us could run fast or the other one could count more accurately. And, and so my concern around these things is that the, the underlying ethical regime of, of um, isolated individuals engaging in contractual relationships is, is on some level profoundly anti-human. Yeah, that's a great point. And that, that's what I'm trying to get to with this, with this cultural aspect, because if you had the opportunity to decide between, say, you want to rent out your place for the weekend, or you have to decide between the interface that charges or an interface that charges 5% that goes to some kind of charitable cause or goes to something, some kind of um, social impact sort of type thing, then we need to start to think about what's valuable. And, um, yeah, although on that model, I'm, that's actually, to me, a completely um, a, a different dimension. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking about is um, what the gentleman at the back is talking about. Is, how, is Another way of stating it is how do we avoid a race to the bottom? So, so, for instance, um, you know, a rich person might be able to afford to rent their place out for less because they don't need the money. Yeah. And so there's this question of, I think, um, it's a very technological mindset that wants to eliminate all the inefficiencies. 
But if we forget that inefficiency is precisely where freedom and equality come from. And if you remove all inefficiency, we've also removed all freedom and we've entrenched inequality. And so I think that um, you know, social solidarity actually requires um, some kind of a, a barrier to um, divide and conquer. And, and so my fear around this kind of stuff is that it, it's forgotten the ethical dimension. And, and although you're talking about you're talking about one ethical dimension, but it's the ethical dimension of individuals. And I think that this is profoundly undermining to the ethical dimension of collectives. Yeah, I, so I, I agree. Um, I'm, again, I'm talking about situations where you know, we see the gig economy coming anyway, so I'm kind of trying to work with that and saying uh, if you know, jobs that we can perform ourselves and we can compartmentalize, even if it's just posting on social media or something, the individual should get something from that. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of going against the alternative of that model, so to say, it's, it's better than just one company sucking, you know, 30% out of every transaction to take it to Silicon Valley. Um, but this is the point, my, my life has improved by not having to wait for a crowd of starving beggars to get to my front door. Yeah. I'm, very, I'm very happy paying taxes in Canada because um, at worst, my taxes are wasted on um, paying, on creating decent jobs for useless administrators who might not actually be able to find a place to contribute. But to me, that makes my world better. Yeah, I think this is great. We're gonna, our next little chunk is a space to have more conversation with each other and then bring some of that back cool. to the big group. So that, I think yeah. that's odd where you're going is. I just want to say I might run behind you with a match to burn your utopian flag. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have used your talk here as, as an encompassing thing. I'm talking about like that you get paid for what you do. I'm talking about the end of exploitation on um, you know micro tasks. Yeah, but yeah, but for sure, yeah, I understand this is society around it, that's my work. Um, yeah. Okay, um so you had said you're talking about the public blockchain, but you also said it's possible to kind of have a private one, essentially. So why would a company not just create a private blockchain for the efficiency, yeah. and then create the platform on top, and it operates fairly similar to our financial system? Yeah, it would. Um, and then which one would you use? That's what I mean. If we, if we value individual data ownership, if you had the opportunity to own your own data and have the autonomy and then you know, use that in the way that you want to, or you want the company to do that? Well, you could argue, couldn't you argue, well, I have a choice now. Do I use mm -hmm. Airbnb or do I go to a hotel? Do yeah. I, like, so, or, and you did. Or do I not, right? Like, like, if I use Airbnb, I'm basically choosing to give them my data. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying there's, a, like, there's going to be another choice. You can fully just continue with the current system. And that's what I mean, that culturally, if we, if we don't care about you know, giving away data, then this well, what I'm trying to get at is like we give away our data, we make that choice to do it because of the convenience and yes. you know just kind of fluidity of those technologies, like you know, and so I guess the thing that the question that's in my mind is more like who's going to put the time and effort to making the, the public platform good, really good. I mean, the closest model in my mind is kind of like Wikipedia, which is like a nonprofit, or I guess there's like Apache, or those yeah, things, right? Exactly. But like, there's also a lot of, like those things exist, but there's still a lot of private that people are using, right? Yeah, um, and that's, to me, Wikipedia is just an early example of this, where you can give a lot of money at a time if there is a distributed solution. Wikipedia is a really easy way of doing that, because it doesn't require much back and forth. And now we're getting to a point where we can actually exchange value automatically. Um, so there will be, you know, different examples of Wikipedia if people want to set them up. Um, people are willing to, to devote time and, and uh, energy into setting these things up. Um, and I think that if we value, you know, if we value minimizing transaction costs for ourselves and, and owning the data, or at least controlling some aspects of the data we're doing, then we're just going to gravitate towards those solutions. But I don't see it as a, yeah. I, I see this more as a trajectory. Um, and it could stop at any point. It could stop if we just don't care about, you know, if we're happy to let a company do it for us. 
um, that it might keep going if people are willing to, to, to push for more distributed solutions. Just think, maybe uh, just yeah, think one more. Yeah, sure, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, just kind of building on that, I kind of think that a lot of the argument that you're making rests up, like about the right sharing service, for instance, rests on the idea that Uber's taking all this money and in fact they've never made a profit. In fact, we're all benefiting from all the PC money that's just being spent to give us free rides and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, I am doubtful that they ever will make a profit. I mean, the uh, reality is that they're facing huge amounts of competition already without any blockchain technology coming in. If you go to New York and get in a car that a driver will usually have four or five cell phones set up and they're on every other network. Mm -hmm. And if you use even just Google Maps or something, you know, it will show you the different prices for all the different mm -hmm. aggregators that are out there. So it seems like a lot of these problems are kind of being solved by the marketplace already and that um, throwing in the complexity of the blockchain, which you said also will like, you know, allow um, making sure that no company's controlling the data. Well, I kind of like the idea of a company controlling the data because at least then it's not just getting up there for everyone to use or disaggregate or you know mine or whatever. I mean, it's, it's to me it's not great that Uber has my right data, but I would much prefer that to anyone in this room having my right data. <laughs> so, um, uh, like I said before, there will be different combinations of what you can actually see. So there might be just transacted data between wallets, and no one can do anything with that. Uh, there, there's probably the data that you might have yourself that you know where you can move around, like your actual how you actually can move around the Uber. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember all the other things you said. Um, but but yeah, I think just the fact that these different combinations are possible and we don't have to have a central organization that just takes money from it. Um, we we're gonna break up those services and you can pick the ones you want that you want to pay for, but you don't have to pay for it. The things package on the whole platform. I know Uber now has low switching costs for most things because yeah, you have multiple phones and just run multiple apps. Uh, so it's not a perfect example, but none of these are really perfect examples for anything. Um, and when I talk about meritocracy, it's not what they won't get fully there. You know, it's inside of. Um, I'm just talking about like yeah, these are ideal types to, to help us kind of conceptualize different alternatives. Um, okay, thanks.